Well, hey, my friends, I'm so glad that you are with me on another edition of the Thriving Christian Artist Podcast. I am super excited today to have a new friend of mine with me, Terry Glaspie, who is not only an award-winning author of just tons of books, but is a lover of the arts, a mentor to creative people, a seminary professor. I could go on and on, but uh, Terry, I'm super glad that you're here. Welcome, man. Glad you're here. Well, it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm honored to, to have this opportunity. I was telling my wife as we were eating lunch a little bit a little while ago, you know, getting ready for this. I said, this is going to be a really great interview, but I'm already over my head. I like this guy is like legit. This is going to be a great, a great uh, interview. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, I'm a big believer that if you can't talk about things in a way that everybody can understand them, you probably don't really understand them yourself. That's right. That's, that's a good moniker to go by. Hey, listen, for those folks that are, you know, just getting to know you, some folks may recognize your name from, from other books and that sort of thing, but why don't you give us the kind of the thumbnail sketch of who you are, what you do in the creative world, and then we'll kind of jump into a little bit of your backstory. Okay. Well, uh, I, uh, I actually worked for a lot of years in the publishing world uh, and then transitioned over uh, a couple of years ago to be uh, self-employed. And so I help people with their projects, uh, do uh, some consulting. Um, and uh, then I I work part time as a seminary professor. I'm teaching a course right now on the people who had an influence on C.S. Lewis, like uh, G.K. Chesterton and yeah. George MacDonald, which is really fun. Uh, and um, I also uh, um, also do a lot of writing myself. I um, uh, I, I, lo I love writing. I hate writing. As anyone who's a writer. <laughs> can identify probably with that statement. It's, uh, it's hard work. Um, um, as someone once said, uh, I hate writing, but I love having written. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the discipline. And, and I think that discipline is true in every one of the arts that, that, that we just have to buckle in and, and do the work. Yeah. Now, do you have a creative practice yourself? Uh, are you involved in the arts and as a practitioner in some way or, uh, mostly it's through my writing. Uh -huh. I, I dabble a little bit in painting, uh, years and years and years ago, I, I, I was doing a little more oil painting at that point And, um, uh, I won a, a couple county fair awards yeah. for, my, for my painting. So not too big of a deal there, but, uh, I've kind of let that lapse, but, um, I'm thinking as I get near to retirement, I, I'd really, I'd like to really re-enter in painting because, um, I love, I, I love studying the work of other painters and that always makes me feel like, Hmm, I'm not sure I could do it, but I'd really like to, I'd really like to try again. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think for all of us who are artists and creative types and we go through our walk with the Lord and he's developing us and we're engaging in our creative practice, whether it's writing or painting or music or whatever it is. For, for many of us, there is this kind of calling or desire to want to share the things that we've learned with, with others. And I know that's been your call as well. So how did that begin to emerge in your life where you started to, to recognize, hey, maybe, maybe the things that God's working in me, I, I have something to say to, to others and, and can begin to bring value into the lives of, of other creatives? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I grew up in a home where... Um, art uh, and books the, these things weren't valued that much mm -hmm. um what what books we had were in a closet uh, as a child uh even as a young person i never went to an art gallery mm -hmm. um but then at a, at a time when i was kind of re-examining where i was at in my walk with christ I discovered the work of C.S. Lewis and Francis Schaeffer, and those two writers in particular really helped me to begin to see, oh, there's, there's a lot more to communicating faith and just some intellectual uh, yeah. uh, conversation, but that, uh, that creativity can be a powerful thing to not only transform my own life, but to communicate my faith effectively to other people. Um, 
And so, you know, that's been kind of an ongoing passion ever since then to where, you know, I have gotten to the point where my latest book is about how the arts can actually be a spiritual discipline, a, a spiritual tool that you can use in your life for growing closer to God. Yeah. And, and, and I hadn't heard people talk about the arts in that way very much. Um, but I know they've been that for me. So I wanted to kind of share about the ways that they were that for me and, and how other people could use them in that way. Yeah, it's a beautiful book. And I definitely want to encourage my listeners to grab that. And uh, if you're on YouTube, you can see the beautiful cover here. It's a great, great book. Uh, Terry was kind enough to, to send me a copy. And I've been perusing that and, and enjoying that uh, in my own devotion time. I, it's funny, Terry, you know, it's I think again, as creatives, we all we all know that there's some sort of divine connection that happens when we get into that creative process. That maybe for me, I'm a, I'm actually a basket maker, um, and so I've I've been making baskets for 30 years, walking the woods, harvest vines and branches and things like that. And I, you know, realize as a young man in college, there's something really powerful about connecting, you know, creatively out here in the woods, and then as my relationship with the Lord deepened. I started realizing, oh, that's Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know, He's He's wanting, He's moving in and through this this beautiful process. And yet, I think for so many of us who've kind of grown up in traditional evangelical churches and that sort of thing over the years, um, that understanding of the arts is is not always there. And I I can remember in two thousand nine through a series of different events, God called me to raise up an army of artists all over the world. And so I've given my life to that um, since then. It's been incredible to watch, but the the church that I was at, I was involved in at the time, I can remember one of the elders had us over for dinner one night and he said, now Matt, this whole arts thing, he's like, what is this about? What in the world does this have to do with bringing people to Jesus? You know, <laughs> And I just had to laugh because it's this kind of idea that unless everything is you know, transactional, somebody heard this, saw this, and then got saved that somehow it isn't valuable in the kingdom. And I love this understanding that that you're bringing and that we are very much for as well is that the arts is this beautiful supernatural language that God's given us to experience him and to allow him to move in and, and through us. So talk about that because it, it, it the arts is so much bigger, I think, than most of the church realizes and so much more of a powerful um, vehicle for us to be able to, to access. Yeah, I, I mean, in one sense, it just strikes me as someone who studied into this, it, it strikes me that it's so odd that the church in our own time has such a fear and suspicion of the arts mm, yeah, as though yeah. somehow the arts are going to draw us away from God. Yeah. You know, and, and of course, there are expressions of the arts which are probably not helpful to us, sure. you know, uh, but uh, but throughout the history of the church, God has used the arts as a way to touch people. I mean, and even before the church, even going back into the Old Testament, I love the fact that when God gave the instructions for creating the temple, he didn't create just this like little warehouse <laughs> where you could go see God. No, it was, the, it was adorned yeah. with all kinds of incredible things, including elements which we might almost consider abstract. Mm. The fact that there were uh, blue pomegranates uh, as part of the decoration. Well, blue pomegranates don't actually exist, <laughs> but that was specifically part of the direction that was yeah. given. And, and it, you know, it, and it says of the, of, uh, of the artists who were uh, given that task that the, 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 the spirit came upon them. This was a calling for them to participate in and, and lead people into a more powerful experience of the presence of God, whether yeah. it be in a worship experience, um, like the way we use so many of the arts to do that, or even just within our own personal daily lives yeah. that um, as artists, we have the opportunity to work with the Holy Spirit to, to get beyond people's, you know, all, all of the little walls they put up to keep God out. Yeah. And a lot of the times those walls 
are largely kind of intellectual uh, reactions and responses. And the cool thing about art is that art kind of does an end run around that wall and art, the arts reach into the deepest part of who we are, into our soul and our spirit. And I think they can move people uh, in spite of themselves. Yeah. And that's yeah. why, among other things, uh, not only are they powerful for believers, but they're also a powerful way of sharing with those who don't yet believe. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I've For the last 10 years or so here in, in Asheville, I've had a gallery and studio space here as a, as a working artist. And so it's always fun to see all my, my friends who are, are new age or, or pre-believers, you know, don't know the Lord yet. They come in and they're like, whoa, something's different in here. Something feels so, so peaceful. And so there's such a rhythm to your work and all that. And of course, I know that's the Lord, you know, moving in and through what I'm doing and they're sensing something, but they can't quite feel that yet. And I love that the Lord uses uh, that process to, I don't know, begin to awaken people's heart to new possibilities and draw them to him. Yeah, and you know, I you, I, uh, I looked at some uh, I looked at some pictures of, of of some of your work, which oh, I'd cool. love to have the opportunity to see in person. But you know, you don't emblazon scripture verses on right. on them. Uh, you you know you, you you let the work itself be the testimony to the beauty and the creativity of God. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think you said earlier something about how we do tend to think of the arts in terms of how are they usable? I mean, for the church, oftentimes it's like, oh, you paint. Oh, well, could you do some Noah's Ark uh, pictures <laughs> for the nursery? Exactly. And, they, they, and to them, that's like the highest thing they could ask you to do. Right. Um and not that there's anything wrong with that. That's that's fine. But our artistic work doesn't always have to have um, immediate theology attached to it to yeah. actually be theologically rich, yeah. to usher people into an unexpected experience of God. And, and that is the thing. When we go to church, we're expecting to, you know, a spiritual experience. The thing about art, the arts is we deliver an experience that people aren't expecting. And oftentimes that experience is a powerful um, spiritual connection. Mm. And, uh, and our art opens doors that couldn't be opened with our words. You yeah, know? absolutely. You know, I'm always, I, I just wrote a, a book this last summer um, called, it was all about prophetic art and engaging the Holy Spirit in the creative process. And one of the things we did is, in every chapter, we just poured in these incredible testimonies from artists all over the world who, who are seeing, seeing healing and deliverance and salvation and all that sort of thing as people encounter their art, which is phenomenal. But one of the things that I really love to, and it, it seems you do as well, because I was going to read a quote from the book. You said, the Bible uh, is a book that confronts us with mysteries and invites us to participate in them. And I, I love that, that as artists, we get to not always have all the answers, if you will, but that we can create work out of relationship and out of encounter with Jesus and trust that in the middle of me doing the thing that I'm called to do, Holy Spirit's going to do the thing that he does best, which is move through and draw people and encounter people in and through my work. Talk about that, that effect of mystery, because I think mystery is often uncomfortable for, for church folk. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, the mystery happens when we realize that something is beyond our experience, beyond our explanation. And, uh, you know, I, I think one of the powerful things that art can do uh, and what its purpose is, um, what, think about, think for a minute about a sermon. The purpose of a sermon is a clear communication of ideas about what God wants from us. That's fine. That's good. We need that. But that art is not about being parallel with the sermon. Hmm. Art has a different method, a different way, God given way of working. So I like to think that, you know, a sermon is about providing answers for people. But, but art is not so much about giving people answers as it is about provoking 
the right kinds of questions. Mm. If you can evoke the right kinds of questions in people's souls and set them to wrestling and asking questions within themselves, the Holy Spirit then is uh, can work with that yeah. to lead people closer to him. And, uh, and, and, and I think it's kind of freeing if we can think about, I don't have to give all the answers in my yeah. heart. Yeah. All I have to do is I have to ask the right kinds of questions and then trust that God will, will use that. And sometimes I might have the opportunity to, uh, in dialogue with somebody, to share what some of my intentions and thoughts were. Sure. But first it comes with evoking the questions. I love that. I love that. And it, again, like you said, it, it takes the pressure off because so many artists, especially nowadays, so many, you know, believers are coming back to their back to artistic practices through their church or through things like what we're doing or whatever. And so they've got, they know that God and art have a connection somehow. And, and you know, depending on the on the stream of, of the body of Christ that they've come from, they they may feel a lot of pressure to have it be God enough or have it be spiritual enough or prophetic enough or whatever, or like you said, emblazon scripture on it. And I just love that, you know, you, you we can absolutely come to this process trusting that the same Holy Spirit that moved in me in the creation process is also going to move in the viewer and in the one that's interacting uh, to, to evoke a response as well. So. J.B. Phillips wrote a book years ago called Your God is Too Small mm. uh, and uh, um, about the fact that we tend to uh, see God as much smaller than God really is. And I think uh, one of the things that art does is it helps us to understand the bigness of God and that he is not he's not limited by one method of reaching people. Yeah. And. I think God, as I look through history, I think God takes a special delight in using that which is beautiful and creative as a way to introduce people to who he is. Um, J.R.R. Tolkien said that only God is a creator. None of us are actually creators. What we are is sub-creators. Yeah, yeah. We take what God has already created, we refashion, recombine, we bring in our own unique internal perspectives as creative people, and then we produce something which is new. Yeah. We actually, as a creative person, we actually are partnering with the Holy Spirit to bring something new into the world. And I mean, if you begin to think of art in that way, it's a little bit mind blowing. Yeah. The, yeah. the largeness of that calling. Yeah. It's a huge, huge invitation. And I think I, I'm so glad through your book and the work of so many of us that are kind of linking arms in this, that the body of Christ and others are starting to, to wake up again to, to this reality. Um, you know, in, in the book, you talk about a lot of overt roles that, you know, the artist plays in society of being more empathetic and speaking out about issues of social justice and even, you know, God using the arts to heal emotional wounds and drawing us closer to, to God. I'd just be interested, you know, as we're talking about this sort of thing of letting the work speak versus overt intention and that sort of thing. Um is there, for those listeners that are brand new to this concept, you know, is there a right way to do it, Terry? Is, you know, do you have to come to your work with this overt intention of this is what I'm going to say? Or is it okay to, and, and equally as powerful from a spiritual perspective, to, to come in and create trusting the process and allowing God to, to um, you know, manifest in whatever way he wants to on the other end? Well, I think God's big enough that he works in different ways. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are those artists who very carefully map out what they're going to do. I mean, like, for example, uh, when Picasso painted Guernica, his great painting of protest against uh, the Civil War uh, in Spain and all the horrors that took place, he did he did hundreds of sketches mm. in preparation for that painting. Um, and yet, so, so sometimes there is a place for letting God work through the process of preparation. But I think there's also a place where sometimes the Holy Spirit just works within us 
in the process of actually creating. We dive in. I, uh, I mean, most great novelists will say that uh, at some point their characters kind of take over and mm -hmm. oftentimes take the story in places that they had never imagined. And I think, uh, I think that's a wedding of our own creativity with yeah. the spirit's creativity within us. Yeah. And so I, you know, I think, I think it's good to do the work and do the discipline uh, and do the preparation. But then when we actually endeavor to do the work, to be ready for, for divine interference, yeah, you know, <laughs> for, for that tap on the shoulder that tells us that maybe there's another direction to go. Maybe there's something, um, maybe there's, maybe there's something we would have never have thought of. Yeah. that suddenly it comes about. I mean, you know, even in writing a book like my book, there are times in which, uh, and I hope this doesn't seem uh, lacking in humility uh, because I, I, I'm trying to drive this direction yeah. needs to go. There are times in which I start into a sentence, suddenly I catch a flow, that sentence turns into a paragraph. And when that paragraph is done, I, I go, that is really good. <laughs> and there's always a surprise yeah. about how good it is because I'm not necessarily convinced that I can write as well as I sometimes write in the book. Now, that's not to say that God is to blame for all my <laughs> Bear awkward, uh, <laughs> exactly. expressions and uh, 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 poor sentence structure and picking the wrong word uh, that you know that, that, that's on me but but sometimes uh it, it, you know um it's about vulnerability mm. i mean really at its root art is all about vulnerability. Um, i mean we as the artist have to be vulnerable to the form and the content that we're working with and, and writing about, we have to kind of give ourselves, we have to surrender. Yeah. On the other side of it, when we're the receiver of art, we also have to be vulnerable to it. Yeah. We have to surrender to it. We have to hold back our judgment long enough to allow it to do its work. Um, I know there are a lot of paintings um, that I might immediately dismiss as, oh, I don't like that. It doesn't appeal to me. That if I actually sit with it and so with some receptivity, suddenly I begin to see what was happening in the heart and the soul of that artist. And it does something in, inside me. Yeah, yeah. It's just, we talk a lot about this dynamic in Exodus 31 of, I call it being filled and skilled, you know, Bezalel was filled yes. with the spirit of God and skilled in every manner of workmanship. And it's, it is that two wings of the plane, right? It's the, the inspiration of the Holy spirit and the intuition and listening to his voice and cooperating with that. And at the same time showing up in the studio every day or wherever it is that we do our creative work and learning the skills. And, and as we flow with that, I think that's that, that sweet spot is where God, God moves beautifully through us. You know, speaking of masterpieces, I would be remiss not to talk about, um, I don't know if you would call it your most significant work, but doggone, it is an incredible <laughs> book, 75 masterpieces that, that every Christian should know. What an incredible volume. Uh, talk a little bit about how you wrote that, how you came to write it, and then I want to ask you the impossible question of which one of these 75 is your favorite. And I'm telling you, I'm throwing my hand in the, in the ring with Henry now and, and saying that Rembrandt's Return of the Prodigal is mine. So oh go my ahead. God. <laughs> you know, I mean, Return of the Prodigal, that painting, uh, the, the kind of impact it had on, uh, on, on, on right now, and it, it was mm, so yeah. profound. And yeah. It's a, it's a work that as I've contemplated it, it has helped me, it's helped me understand more about the depth of God's love for me than probably any sermon I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. It's just such a powerful, 
it so powerfully captures the way the hands of the father are resting on the shoulders of the prodigal son as he kneels in repentance. And the look on his face is one of complete, utter grace and forgiveness. Meanwhile, the religious, you know, older brothers are looking on. And, uh, uh, and so often that's what religion does within us. Yeah. Religion often makes us become the judge of others and, uh, and makes us think more highly of ourselves than of them. And we're reminded by a painting like Rembrandt that God has something for us much deeper than religion, that he has that intimate love and relationship and forgiveness. And no matter how much I've squandered the gifts that he's given me, he's always ready to receive me back. Yeah. Yeah. So good. always ready to receive me back. So I'm sorry. I lapsed into sermon mode there. No, that was, but, that was great. How long did it take you to write that book? I mean, I'm assuming this, I'm thinking to myself, was this years and years of, of notes and reflections and that sort of thing that came together? I mean, how do, how do you even approach something like that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, it literally, you know, when someone asked how long did it take you to write the book? I mean, the actual sitting down and writing it, I did over a period of a little over a year, but the, the reading and the, and the watching and looking and listening uh, that I did, um, I mean, that's 30, 35 years worth of, yeah. uh, of, of uh, study uh, when it goes into then what becomes, because the interesting thing about the book is I wanted to make it accessible for everybody. So all of the pieces are fairly short. Um, they're, you know, two to 3000 words yeah. each. And they, I tried really hard not to use technical terms from art or literature. I wanted it to be able to communicate. And what I discovered is sometimes it takes a lot more effort to make things concise yes. than to just let them roll out. Uh, the, the, uh, the great Roman orator and writer Cicero said, uh, if I had lived longer, I would have written less. <laughs> and uh, so I learned a little bit of what Cicero is talking about in, in that process. But, uh, but it was such a joy to revisit all these works. And I mean, what I was striving for, I mean, I'm not really saying these are the 75 best. Right. I'm just saying that these are 75 works of art, music, literature, architecture, and film that um, somehow are an expression of the faith of the person who created them. And so there's everything from the art of the Roman catacombs, uh, which I had the joy of looking at in Rome, all the way up to like U2's The Joshua Tree album uh, and the art of, uh, of uh, Mikado Fujimura. Yeah. So um, there's... Uh, um, it, it's just a way of saying we have this amazing heritage as Christians. Mm. I think sometimes we look at a lot of the modern Christian art that's in like, well, if you even want to call it art, that's in uh, the, you know, Christian bookstores and, you know, some of the, some of the Christian films and Christian yeah. novels that are being produced aren't, the, aren't, aren't artistically that good. Um, they just have a propaganda use and they're not really that great as art. They don't evoke questions. Right, right. All they do is rush to give the answer. So uh, I think I lost the train of thought where I was going. <laughs> well, um, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think these 75 are, are, the, are, are pieces that ask questions and they, they evoke questions. Yeah, that, I'm with you on that. Yeah, and whoever you are, you'll probably, some of them you'll immediately like and others you might go, if it was me, I wouldn't have put that in this book. <laughs> and, you know, uh, probably anybody writing a book like this would probably write a little bit different book. But yeah. I'm just saying these are different uh, from different genres and different styles and different time periods. Just saying we have this amazing heritage as Christian artists mm. uh, of Christian art and, and expression through the arts. And, you know, and I really believe that one of the mistakes a lot of, uh, you know, okay, I'm going to 
point the finger and preach <laughs> just for a moment. Um, you know, for a lot of Christian artists today are not spending enough time with the great art that came before them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, you know, it, you will not only learn something about improving your craft, but you'll also be spiritually nourished and, and, you know, get outside of your comfort zone. If you're a painter, not only should you know about some of the great Christian painters of the past, but you should know about some of the great Christian musicians and novelists yeah. because we're all on this journey together and we can learn from the different things that others have seen. And so uh, a, a great uh, 12th century philosopher and theologian, uh, Bernardus of Silvestrius said, if we see further than those who came before us, it's because we stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. And there are giants of the arts whose work we can stand upon to give ourselves a higher perspective and and a longer view as we attempt to um to express uh, our faith and uh, who we are through our art forms yeah so end of sermon I'll take the collection <laughs> well terry you are a gift to the body of christ i believe history will show you are, you're one of those giants that's helping us to be awakened and, and see further and see what what god's got for us in the kingdom through the arts, but thank you so much for being on the podcast. If folks are wanting to get their, get your books, of course, we'll have the links in the show notes, but let everybody know where they can connect with you online and where they can uh, grab your resources. Yes. Uh, well, you can, the books are available pretty much uh, anywhere that you can uh, purchase books. Uh, or if you would really like to have a signed copy uh, you can go to my website, which is terryglaspie.com, T-E-R-R-Y-G-L-A-S-P-E-Y.com. And uh, there I, not as frequently as I should, do a little blogging, uh, but uh, there's also a place where you can uh, order the books and, and get them signed. But, uh, but if you want to get it uh, quickly, Amazon, Christ, Christian book distributors, Barnes and Noble, or your local bookstore either has it or can get it. Great, great. Well, Terry, what a joy. Thank you, my friend, for, for being on today and for all the work that you're doing in the kingdom.